Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in History. I'm your host, Mr. Merrigan. Welcome, as always. We're going to continue talking about this idea of manifest destiny. and What a great place to kind of start. We're going to highlight here a little bit of how we've seen additions to the United States and a little bit more as we get through today, we're going to see a lot more of this idea of manifest destiny being realized. So, kind of looking at our map here, 1783, here in the green on your map, this is what we've seen established as the United States. So, a lot of the territory east of the Mississippi. You're also going to see, we've talked a little bit about how Florida was added, I think the Adams on East Treaty, certainly occupied, and then later uh, acquired by the United States here, and then from Spain as well, Louisiana. We talked... Um, in the past, also about the Oregon country, it's seceded by Great Britain in 1846. And we've also seen some additions here uh, by Great Britain in parts of what are now Minnesota as well as North Dakota. And of course, here in northeastern Minnesota as well, and then also in Maine. We talked last time about the annexation of Texas, and we're going to talk about the new border that comes out of the war with Mexico or the Mexican American War. We're going to see this territory added today. We're going to talk about the Mexican secession and, of course, the Gadsden Purchase. So the borders of the contiguous or the connected United States, sometimes we refer to them as the lower 48. We're going to see that kind of those boundaries by the end of today in our discussion here. They're going to be filled. So let's go ahead and get started. So just kind of an idea to get us started with, and then we'll kind of get into our learning targets, is the Santa Fe Trail was very busy. Um, much like the United, or what we saw with the Oregon Trail, it became a trade route. This one was a little bit less for settlement, at least originally. Later, it's going to definitely encourage that. But again, trade route from Missouri to large portions of the Mexican province of Mexico, which again is going to be an area that the United States later is going to be interested in acquiring. So the Spanish have learned from their history, and they've learned from the history of what's going on in North America, that when you invite Americans into your territory, little things happen. Okay? They start to realize this, of course, with uh, Florida and other places. And so the Spanish tried really hard to keep Americans away from Santa Fe and the Santa, you know, Santa Fe territory um, and the New Mexican. New Mexico Territory, and they feared that Americans would want to take it over. And again, they've seen this happen with their own territory in North America, and they've learned certainly from the British as well as other empires that you don't want to invite Americans in, not unless you want uh, perhaps them to take it over. And so they tried very hard to keep Americans out. We're going to see, though, that that doesn't work. And so after gaining its independence from Spain, Mexico um, decides that they're going to actually welcome Americans um, and traders arriving in New Mexico along the Santa Fe Trail. They see it as an economic opportunity. They see it as an opportunity for them perhaps to have people come and settle in and bring those resources and those financial gains back to Mexico. But we are going to see that as that continues, that leads to more and more tension between Mexico and the United States. And so, despite the welcoming earlier, it is going to lead us towards a dispute and then eventually to war. So, California, we're going to see, we're going to kind of start with the Mexico side of things, and then we're going to talk about how that leads to conflict. So, we're going to identify why California was settled by Mexicans, and then later uh, the introduction of Americans in this region. And so California uh, had been settled in the 1700s by missionaries that were coming from Mexico. And of course, this is Spanish territory at this point in history. Um, that were really hoping to promote what we call the three G's, gold, God, and glory. And among those was this idea of converting Native Americans to Christianity. And that's going to continue with Mexico. Again, we call these the three Gs. So in the case of gold, that's personal wealth. That's the wealth of the Spanish Empire, as well as later on the Mexican Empire. Um, in the case of God, that's promoting 
Christianity, in particular Catholicism, in the case of Spain and Mexico, and then it's done for the glory of the empire, first Spain, then later on Mexico. We see these same kind of motivations with other Europeans, primarily with the British, but instead of the three Gs, we have the three Cs. So in the case of gold, the equivalent for the British would have been commerce. They wanted to set up trade. They wanted to set up routes that could, one, bring resources and mineral wealth back to Britain, but also bring them new trade routes that they could sell their goods, so aka make more money. God, as far as your sees, is Christianity. The only big difference between these two is that, like we mentioned, Spain and Mexico tended to be predominantly Catholic nations, whereas uh, Great Britain at this point in history would be more of a Protestant nation, Church of England. And then your glory equivalent for your seas would have been civilization. The British really believed that they had this great idea about how the world should be run, and they wanted to spread their ideas and their way of doing things. Now, in the case of both the Spanish and certainly British, we see that influence in a variety of different countries even today. So I'll tell that it's in some ways. So establishing this culture in 1821, uh, California actually became a state in this newly independent Mexico. And so Mexicans settled here, um, really this great land opportunity. Mexico is a newly independent nation, and they set up these huge estates that are called ranchos, and they're owned by people called rancheros. These are Mexican ranch owners. Like we've seen with the United States, like we've seen with this expansion west, that's a big thing that attracts people to California and what has attracted people west in general is this idea of there's more land to be owned. There's greater opportunity. You don't may necessarily have to have the same level of wealth that you would, uh, say, in southern Mexico or even in the southern United States or the northern United States. It was a good new economic opportunity for people. And in particular, you've got John C. Fremont who praises this idea of what California could be. He praises its great, mild climate. If you've ever been to California, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, ranges from marine west coast to even a Mediterranean-like climate as you get into Southern California. And there's an abundancy of natural resources that are going to start to attract a variety of different people, including Americans. And ha! Huh, Remember that idea of manifest destiny when we said the whole continent should be ours? Maybe California should be a part of that. And so this kept planting the seed of making California a part of the United States. And so you can already see where this is headed. This is certainly heading towards conflict. But we'll get there. So we're going to be able to explain how war broke out here. So we've got the seed planted in the United States of Mexico um, that this territory could be very valuable economically, but also for a place for people to live. And so disagreements start, certainly start to pop out. And one of those disagreements is over New Mexico, of course, California, and this new border with Texas. Where is it? And of course, Americans are going to claim that it's further west, and Mexico is going to claim that it's further east. And so that strains the relationships between the United States and Mexico to the point where war breaks out. And the idea here, again, yeah, fueled by this idea of manifest destiny, is that, yeah, this, this should be ours. And um, God is destined. So we're going to see that war is going to commence. Mexican soldiers are going to attack the American forces who have crossed the disputed border. And it's going to lead to a conflict over the territory. So war begins, and much like we saw in the Texas War of Independence, this is not going to be an easy victory for the United States, um, although the big difference between these two is that those were Texans fighting against the uh, Mexican government, and now you've got the U.S. government uh, fighting against the Mexican government. So it's going to be certainly a bigger scale war. And so many Californios, or these are Mexicans who are living in California, similar to what we talked about last time with your Tejanos, uh, they're going to be opposed to annexation uh, to the United States. But by the time we get to 1874, 
California was going to be fully controlled by the United States. And so you're certainly going to see that um, a large scale success of the United States is kind of moving forward. From there. And probably the feather in the cap here is when General Winfield Scott marches south and he's able to capture Mexico City, the Western capital of Mexico. And soon uh, the Mexican government pretty much has no choice but to surrender. The big question coming out of that surrender is what is Mexico going to have to give up? And what are the terms of this going to be? And those terms are laid out in the treaty, which is the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo. And Mexico is going to have to give up a lot. They've already given up part of Texas, but they're going to have to give up more of Texas now. And they're going to agree that the Rio Grande, or the Rio Grande, um, is going to serve as the new border between Texas and Mexico. For the most part, uh, that's still the border today. And then you're going to have the Mexican session. And this is where Mexico is going to be forced to cede, which means to give up, in this case, by treaty, California and New Mexico to the United States. And they're going to do it for $15 million, which is the same price they paid the Louisiana Purchase. So, in this case, not as much land, but certainly still um, what they thought was a fair deal given the resources that Mexico would be losing out on. Certainly we could debate that. And so the United States also realizes that as it wants to further expand, and this is a little bit later, is that ideally they need a better route for um, a southern transcontinental railroad. And so in 1853, the United States offers $10 million for what's called the Gadsden Purchase. And this is, again, the U.S. mainland reached what we would say is now its present size. So let me kind of show you what I mean. So we've seen now, okay, the addition, of course, of Texas, but now we've got that new border, the Rio Grande River, the Rio Grande River. Okay? Um, and we also mentioned here the secession of Mexico. So this territory is now part of the United States. These aren't states yet, um, but they will certainly see that. We're going to talk a little bit more about California uh, in our next section, um, in our next video. But you're also certainly here to have the Gadsden Purchase, and this is again a little bit later in 1853. And this is the modern border. So the Gila River, or the Gila River, um, used to be, excuse me, it would be just Gila River, there's no two L, um, would have been the, the original border, and then partially down here to the south. But again, the idea was that it needed to go a little bit further south to be ideal for this new train route. So again, Southern Transcontinental Railroad. So you've got the Gadsden Purchase of the Capital in 1853. And so the lower 48, again, what we sometimes refer to as the contiguous United States, that's how we get here. And so it's certainly through a great deal of negotiation, in some cases war, that we arrive at our lower 48. Now, of course, we'll see a little bit later how we add Alaska and Hawaii to the 50 states that we know today. But that gives you a little bit of a picture about how we got here. So that's going to wrap up another edition of Mr. Merrigan's Moments in History. I hope you enjoyed it. For my students, I hope you followed along with the guided notes. And if you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, for those of you who on, are listening here just for the information. I really appreciate you guys and want to thank you for listening. So until next time, I'm Mr. Merrigan. Have a great day.